Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Talal al Salim. I'm the creator of Systematic Affair Recovery Therapy and the founder of the Infidelity Counseling Center. And if you are watching this course, you're probably dealing with the aftermath of the discovery of an emotional and or a sexual affair. And I'm so sorry that uh, you're having to view this course for that reason. Uh, dealing with infidelity is one of the worst things that could happen to an individual in a relationship. My hope behind creating this course is to give you uh, all the basic information that you need to know about affair recovery, as well as uh, help put you on the right path of healing. So let's go ahead and go over the presentation outline. In this course, we're going to go over some important background information about infidelity. We're going to talk about uh, how to define infidelity and the significance of uh, coming up with an agreed upon definition of infidelity. We will also talk about the causes of infidelity and uh, the concept of healing and whether or not it's possible and what that means to you and your partner. And we will also spend a lot of time talking about the milestones of recovery. And lastly, we're going to end with uh, talking about how to find the right therapist as well as what to expect from the therapy process. So let's get to it. So let me share with you some important background information about infidelity. I'm going to share with you three important facts. Fact number one, um, infidelity is more common than you think. In 41% of marriages, one or both spouses admit to infidelity, either uh, emotional or sexual. In 74% of men and 68% of women, uh, they say that they would engage in an affair if they weren't worried so much about the consequences of discovery, which means that we have a lot of people who fantasize about infidelity, but they don't do it because of the fear of discovery. Uh, also, therapist surveys have identified that uh, extramarital uh, sex, as well as uh, emotional infidelity, are one of the common reasons for uh, seeking couples counseling. Almost 46% of couples who are going to couples counseling are usually doing so because they're trying to heal from the aftermath of a recent discovery or a past discovery of infidelity. Fact number two, a large number of affairs are born in the workplace. Uh, there was a study that found that 36% of men and women admit to having an affair with a coworker. Uh, and if you think about it, it makes sense. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, at the workplace, especially for those of us who work uh, full time. And you hear people joke all the time about having a work husband or work wife. Uh, a lot of times those jokes are reflections of uh, poor boundaries. If uh, not being addressed could evolve into emotional and or sexual affairs. And also having affairs in the workplace usually have additional layer of problems for the couples who are dealing with those types of infidelities because now they have to worry about uh, how do they deal with this exposure in their workplace? Do they have to switch works? How do they reset boundaries with the affair partner? Is that even possible? Uh, as well as the litany of potential uh, legal and HR complication if the discovery is handled uh, in the wrong way. Uh, fact number three, infidelity is considered to be one of the most clinically challenging uh, issues to treat, uh, as well as uh, therapists report that they are ill-prepared to deal with it. There was a recent survey of marriage and family therapists in the U.S. that have identified that 74% of therapists uh, feel that the training programs uh, did not adequately prepare them for dealing with infidelity, which is uh, one of the main reasons I created the Systematic Affair Recovery Therapy uh, model to help give therapists the tools that they need to deal with one of the most devastating issues that impact couples. So let's talk about defining infidelity and why is it important for you and your partner to have an agreed upon definition of infidelity. So infidelity is one of those constructs that is uh, very difficult to define uh, because people come from different backgrounds to different types of relationship, different part, different kinds of uh, worldviews that tends to shape their idea of what they consider to be faithful and unfaithful behavior in a committed relationship. Uh, believe it or not, uh, not all relationships uh, are built on an expectation of emotional and sexual exclusivity. There are a lot of uh, relationships 
that doesn't have this traditional models. Uh, for example, there are a lot of people who are in open marriages or people who uh, identify as uh, polyamorous. Uh, those guys, these will deal with infidelity as well. It just uh, looks different based on their relationship contract. So bringing this back full circle to, you know, why is it important to uh, have an agreed upon definition of infidelity, think of it this way. In order for us to fix a problem, we have to put the right label on it. So when people show up to the first session and I ask the betrayed, why are we here? Oftentimes the betrayed says, I'm here because my partner cheated on me. You ask the unfaithful, why are we here? The unfaithful might say, well, I'm here because I did something stupid. Well, which one is it? Is it infidelity or is it just garden variety, something stupid? Because if it was uh, a small issue and we called it infidelity when it was it, we actually exaggerated a small problem. Uh, if it was actually infidelity and we called it something stupid or we called it something that just kind of whitewashed what it is, then we just minimize a significant problem. Uh, so this is why it's important for the betrayed as well as the unfaithful partner uh, with agreement with the therapist to have the right label on the problem, especially if this problem is infidelity. So how do we define infidelity? How can we come up with a definition that can accommodate all the differences that people have when it comes to how they conceptualize what's considered to be uh, appropriate or inappropriate uh, uh, behavior in a committed relationship. So this was the first puzzle that I had to solve in my systematic affair recovery therapy model. So I'll give you my definition of infidelity and hopefully this definition can help you and your partner be on the same page. Uh, but before I give you the definition, I'm going to give you the context of uh, how this definition was created. So I truly believe that relationship with your significant other should be treated as a business partnership in the sense that we need to have a relationship contract that help outline how many partners we have in this relationship. Is it one? Is it two? Is it 20? Uh, what are the emotional and sexual needs that are expected to be fulfilled by the partners that we have this relationship contract with? And to what extent the fulfillment of those uh, emotional and sexual needs is exclusive to the partners that we have in the relationship? So uh, how, how does this tie to the infidelity? So if we are on board with this concept of uh, relationships uh, requiring a relationship contracts that identify the number of partners as well as the expected uh, emotional and sexual needs that needs to be fulfilled exclusively by those partners. This makes infidelity defined as follow. A conscious breach of contract of exclusivity with the partners in the relationship. It's engaging in any need fulfilling behavior outside the relationship without the consent of the current partners. So based on this definition, the type of emotional and sexual exclusivity that you agreed with with your partner when you entered this relationship is going to determine the threshold for the label of infidelity and whether or not what happened is actually uh, fall within those parameters. Um, for example, uh, people ask me all the time, is pornography considered to be a form of infidelity? Well, yes and no. It depends on the relationship contract. If part of the relationship contract was requiring sexual exclusivity, not just when it comes to actual sex uh, uh, done uh, through intercourse or other forms of sexual activity, but let's say that part of the exclusivity contract is that I don't want my partner to be sexually stimulated by somebody else even if they don't actually have sex with them, even if the sexual stimulation leads just to masturbation versus actual engagement with that individual. If that's the relationship contract, uh, then watching pornography uh, clearly violate those parameters. Um, and another example, people will sometimes try to uh, see virtual interaction as not real forms of infidelity. You know, is texting somebody a form of infidelity or is, uh, you know, following one of those Instagram models and liking their pictures? Uh, I give the same uh, answer. If part of the exclusivity requirement included uh, uh, sexual excitement or sexual stimulation and the purpose of watching these uh, 
uh, folks that follow them is for that sexual excitement, then you're breaching your contract. Uh, I always tell folks the parameters of emotional sexual exclusivity should be applicable in the real world or the virtual world. So it happening virtually does not make it less applicable. Um, sexual infidelity usually is uh, easier for people to wrap their mind around. Uh, it's emotional uh, infidelity that gets more challenging because uh, there's nothing in the rule book where it says, you know, just because you're in a committed relationship, nobody else is allowed to fulfill your emotional needs. Uh, that would be ridiculous if we uh, set the stage for that kind of premise, because we all have friends, colleagues, family members who sometimes fulfill some of our emotional needs, uh, meaning not all our emotional needs are expected to be fulfilled exclusively by our partner. So that's where it gets tricky. Uh, to me, uh, emotional infidelity also should not mean falling in love with someone because somebody could be engaging in emotional infidelity without them falling in love with someone. To me, emotional infidelity is allowing somebody to fulfill an emotional need that was supposed to be exclusive for you and your partner. Uh, an example of this, uh, let's say part of the emotional exclusivity was for you to uh, not uh, use somebody else to vent your relationship problems or use somebody else to process things that you're struggling with, that this is something that your partner expecting you to do with them and them only, or maybe them and them first, and maybe the individual therapist that you see. Uh, or a different version of this would be if uh, there was an expectation of uh, you as a partner is not to do things that should be somebody else's partner's job. Uh, com common manifestation of this that I see in clinical practice, you know, uh, where uh, somebody's husband is uh, sending a lot of uh, positive affirmation to a female coworker uh, that he works with. And, you know, well, when you ask why you're doing this, well, she has low self esteem, she's struggling in her relationship, she needs somebody to you know, make her feel heard and seen. Well, that's nice, but that's not your job. That's the job of her partner. That's the job of her individual therapist. So really a good way to conceptualize emotional infidelity is thinking about the things that should be uh, fulfilled by uh, uh, a committed partner versus somebody else who is a friend. And again, this is something that the therapist that you're going to see will help uh, the two of you navigate to find the right label. Let's talk a little bit about the causes of infidelity. So when I train my clinicians in the systematic affair recovery therapy model, I encourage them to look at the causes of infidelity from three distinct lenses. Uh, I ask them to look at the etiology from the relationship factor lens, uh, from the individual factors lens, and lastly, from the sociocultural and environmental factors lens. Now, even though each one of those categories, it's unique and distinct and with its own specific list of factors, uh, all of these categories are interconnected and can influence one another in a bidirectional fashion. Um, it's important when we're talking about the causes of infidelity to highlight uh, this discussion is not meant to excuse infidelity because as far as I'm concerned, there is nothing that can excuse or justify infidelity. I've been doing this for many years and I have yet to see a case where I say, yes, infidelity was justifiable behavior. Uh, so, you know, looking at the causes of infidelity, it's really an explanation of why infidelity happened versus a justification for it. And I even make this case, even in the cases in which uh, infidelity uh, happened primarily for a relationship factor or relationship deficit. I was told unfaithful, you know, you could have the worst partner in the universe, even if you're somebody who is not able or willing to fulfill your needs. That in itself does not give you the permission to be unfaithful. If you're not happy with your partner, if you're not happy with yourself, you have options. You can uh, go to counseling before you cheat. You can end the relationship and walk away before you cheat. So infidelity is uh, never uh, an acceptable solution for a problem that actually needs to be fixed. So again, long story short, uh, there has to be a distinction between uh, 
explaining why this happened versus excusing why it happened. So hopefully that makes this point clear. So let's take a look at each one of those uh, etiological factors. So the first lens that we're going to examine under the causes of infidelity is the relationship factors. So uh, we don't have the time to cover every relationship issue that could lead to infidelity, but I'm going to share with you some of the common ones that I have encountered in my clinical practice. Uh, but uh, think about it this way. Uh, think of any relationship dysfunction or relationship dynamic that could cause individuals not to have their emotional and sexual needs met, and you would have the perfect recipe for inviting infidelity. Uh, but we're going to go over some of the top ones. Uh, so the first relationship issues that could lead to infidelity is the issue of incompatibility. What do I mean by incompatibility? Uh, there is nothing in the rule book that says in order for people to be happy and successful uh, that they have to be uh, carbon copy from one another. I actually feel that, you know, relationships are healthier and more enriching if you were somebody who is different than you are because we all have different experiences based on how we grew up and the uh, things that we encountered. So meeting somebody who is different than you can actually help you grow uh, in certain areas. So when I'm talking about uh, incompatibility, I'm talking about major differences, not just small differences, major differences in important areas of life uh, that are crucial for relationship success, such as the case uh, differences in sexuality, differences in intellect, differences in uh, political and religious ideologies, uh, a lot of these areas where there is a, a big piece of compa incompatibility or major differences, people are going to struggle to find a middle ground to find healthy compromises on. Um, why does incompatibility happen? Uh, unfortunately, we live in a day and age where we don't really take the adequate time to figure out who we are. Uh, and uh, the qualities that we look for in a partner. So sometimes incompatibility happens from the get-go because people then don't take the time to figure out who they are, what their needs uh, uh, are, as well as finding the right partner who's able to fulfill those needs. You know, we see somebody that we like, we're attracted to, we get infatuated, we escalate our commitment, and then realize a little bit too late after we have committed our life together that this person is not compatible in an important domain. Other times, uh, incompatibility happens uh, later on in life. There are a lot of people who take the time to figure out who they are and find the right partner. But nature of life is change. We all grow and change. And sometimes people grow and change in opposite direction to the point where they're not compatible. Uh, so I'll give an example. One of the couples that I worked with, husband and wife, uh, both of them uh, met through work. Both of them were correctional officers, so they have that in common. And, uh, you know, uh, the first 20 years of the relationship, no issues. They're happy, got along fine. Uh, then they decided to retire. After the retirement, the wife decided to stay home and enjoy her retirement. The husband decided that he wanted to go back to school and get higher education and uh, decided to get his PhD in criminal justice and teach at the university. Uh, so even though this was a positive thing that he engaged in, uh, it ended up creating a big intellectual gap between him and his wife. Uh, prior to getting his degree, both of them had the same education, same training. They were able to relate to one another, have a lot of things in common. Uh, her staying home and him getting uh, this uh, advanced degree made him feel that he could no longer relate to her. Uh, so he started to develop an attraction to a female colleague of the university that he was teaching at. Uh, this led to poor boundary uh, that ended up evolving into emotional and later on sexual affair. So here's an example of a couple who were compatible for the longest period of their time. Uh, but because one of them decided to pursue higher education, it created an intellectual gap uh, of compatibility between the two. And we can make the same argument for uh, people who change their political identity. You can have uh, people who uh, 
uh, change spiritually, whether it become more spiritual or less spiritual. Uh, there are a lot of situations where people end up growing apart because of things that happened to one individual and it did not happen to the other. Poor communication is also a leading cause of uh, relationship deficits that end up leading to uh, emotional and sexual affairs. So in order for somebody to have their needs met in the relationship, first they have to know what those needs are. But uh, the second important step is to be able to communicate effectively with their partner about, the, about those needs, especially when those needs are not being fulfilled. Uh, when you have couples who don't have good communication skills uh, and they're not able to express uh, their needs deficit their partner, uh, they're going to be in a relationship without those needs being fulfilled because your partner is not a mind reader. Uh, and this is also the case when uh, not only when people don't communicate, but also when people communicate poorly to the point uh, in which that the, the partner is not able to listen and validate the, the need deficits that they're trying to communicate about. Uh, sometimes you have people who are good with communicating their needs when they're not being met, but they're really bad when it comes to conflict resolutions. So poor conflict resolution skills can also be a leading uh, factors for infidelity. Uh, so uh, not only a person need to be able to communicate about their needs in a very direct and clear manner, uh, couples need to actually have good conflict resolution skills and conflict resolution skills will help them identify the cause of the need deficits and reach the necessary compromises that they need to address this deficit. So not only we need uh, good communication skills, we also need uh, good conflict resolution skills. Uh, another relationship factor that could lead to infidelity is uh, being overwhelmed with life stressors. Uh, we all wear many hats. Uh, we're not just uh, husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends. A lot of us are parents as well as uh, professionals. And oftentimes when people have uh, a lot of life stresses in their life, uh, a lot of things on their plate with limited support, uh, sometimes uh, people tend to put their relationship needs on the back burner. Uh, why do they do this? Uh, sometimes it's taking their partner for granted. Sometimes it's just they think that, uh, you know, putting their relationship needs on the back burner would not be harmful, that this is, you know, something that we just do temporarily and my partner would be okay without their needs being met. Uh, and sometimes it's just kind of poor socializing. I think we're all kind of uh, wrongfully taught that it is okay to have a rut in the relationship that this is what committed relationship uh, would lead to then and that is not accurate uh you know a healthy relationship regardless of how long you're in them should not have a rut because when you have needs are not being met those needs are not going to go away they're just going to be manifested outside the relationship which is something that we all want to avoid so uh, people who uh, have a tendency to not paying attention to the stresses that they have and what's on their plate, or they have that awareness and they don't prioritize a relationship, they tend to find themselves in a situation where there is a huge relationship deficit. And as, as I mentioned before, uh, ignoring their needs and not going to make them go away, uh, they're just going to end up... Uh, uh, growing a huge need deficit, which will manifest uh, the fulfillment of those needs outside the relationship by somebody else. Uh, the last relationship factor that we want to talk about is uh, the failure to recognize and adapt to change. Uh, when people have a new stressor in their life, whether it's a positive stressor or a negative stressor, they really need to take the time to pause and try to figure out how is this new stressor is going to impact uh, their life. And I make the, the case uh, even, you know, uh, regardless of whether a stressor is going to be actually something that's planned or something that was a surprise. Uh, because when you have a new stressor in your life, it would be unrealistic to expect that uh, your needs are going to be fulfilled in the same way as they were prior to this new stressor. But also it would be equally unrealistic to give up on those needs and just say you're not going to fulfill them because you don't have the time or energy. So what needs to happen is pausing uh, with your partner, talking about this new change and figuring out a new way 
to meet each other's needs under the light of this new stressor. Classic example of this I see when we're dealing with sexual affairs. You have a couple who've been happy in their sexual life when it comes to the quantity and the quality. Then they decide uh, to grow their family by either conceiving a baby or adopting a baby. And they make one of two common mistakes. They either expect their sex life to be exactly the same prior to this new stressor, which is unrealistic because this new life is going to be take time of energy. Uh, or they make the other mistake of becoming overwhelmed with their role as parents and they ignore uh, the sexual aspect of their life. So what needs to happen when a situation like this takes place is for the couple to sit together and figure out uh, a new way to fulfill each other's sexual needs that accommodate the life stressors that they're going through rather than giving up on it completely. So hopefully uh, this illustrates uh, the most common relationship factors uh, that lead to needs deficit and how can this uh, manifest through infidelity. All right, so we spent a lot of time talking about the relationship factors that could lead to infidelity. And now let's spend some time talking about the individual factors that could lead to infidelity. So we all uh, have seen those relationships or have been in those relationships where uh, it is clear that there is no relationship deficits or compatibility issue, uh, yet somehow we're still dealing with uh, the discovery of infidelity. Uh, sometimes infidelity has nothing to do with relationship uh, satisfaction or relationship deficits. Uh, sometimes it has to do with an individual issue that the unfaithful partner is dealing with and brought uh, with them in the relationship or uh, developed that issue while they were in the relationship with the betrayed. So I'm going to share with you some of the common individual issues that lead to infidelity. Uh, here's my disclaimer on it. Uh, don't uh, start uh, diagnosing your uh, partner. Uh, giving somebody a diagnosis require a lot of assessment, a lot of skills to make sure that somebody actually have the right label. Also, more importantly, uh, just because an individual deal with this issue or have this mental issue, it doesn't automatically make them uh, destined to be unfaithful. It's just that it is uh, going to increase the likelihood of them engaging to infidelity simply due to the stressors of the symptoms that they deal with uh, as a result of having this mental health issue. More importantly, uh, if the infidelity or one of the reasons that infidelity happened is related to a mental health issue or individual issue, that still does not uh, let the unfaithful off the hook because we all have responsibility for making sure that uh, our mental well-being is taken care of, especially if we actually know that we have an individual issue that needs to be treated. It is our obligation to make sure that we're engaged in the proper services to make sure that we're managing those symptoms so they don't cause uh, destruction in our life. So let's start with bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. In order for somebody to have one of these diagnoses, they actually have to have a manic episode or a hypomanic episode, uh, both of which include symptoms uh, related to poor impulse control, impaired judgment, as well as reckless behaviors that can manifest through emotional and sexual infidelity. Uh, personality disorders is also a common uh, individual cause of infidelity, especially people who are dealing with uh, cluster B traits. Uh, I'm going to share with you some of the common personality disorders that I have encountered in my practice and explain why they tend to have higher prevalence rates of infidelity. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is narcissistic personality disorder. If you are living with somebody who's a narcissist, uh, it means that you're living with somebody who uh, is going to be needing a lot of attention from multiple sources. Uh, a narcissist could be with a partner who actually giving them all the attention that they need, but it's never enough. Uh, they want more of it than they want it from multiple sources. Also, a narcissist uh, is someone who's going to be uh, 
not playing by the same rules of exclusivity they expect from their partner and the idea behind it. Uh, I'm special, I'm unique, I don't have to play by the same rules that I expect of you. Uh, so uh, these are some of the main reasons why somebody with narcissistic personality disorder could engage in infidelity behavior. Uh, another personality disorder that have higher prevalence rates of infidelity is people with antisocial personality disorder. Uh, somebody who is antisocial is going to be someone who have complete disregard to the right of others in general. It's going to be somebody who actually enjoy uh, being uh, deceptive and enjoy uh, seeing uh, others uh, being tr tricked or uh, being hurt. Uh, so if you have a partner who is struggling with antisocial personality disorder, uh, they are going to be the type of people who enter a contract of emotional and sexual exclusively, knowing real well that they're not going to be uh, honoring that contract. Because if they don't care about the rights of others in general, why would they care about your rights as uh, your partner in the relationship? Uh, borderline personality disorder also tend to have a higher rate of uh, emotional and sexual infidelity, and this has to do with the borderline uh, instability and in self-image, uh, this need for attention from their partner. So somebody with borderline personality disorder uh, not only can um, engage in manipulative uh, behavior or self-harming behavior to get attention to keep the uh, partner in their relationship uh, to compel them to give them attention. Sometimes it goes beyond that. So I'm going to make you jealous by giving somebody else attention so that you can give me more of the attention that I'm needing from you. And sometimes that manifests in poor boundaries with others uh, that will lead to emotional and sexual affairs. Another individual factor that could lead to infidelity is the issue of sexual identity and sexual orientation. Uh, our idea of sexuality and sexual identity orientation is changing and evolving, which is a good thing because for the longest time we had this rigid view about sexual um, identity as well as uh, sexual orientation, which uh, unfortunately have caused a lot of people to uh, live in fear, live in the closet, and be unclear about who they are or not feeling safe enough to be who they are. So because of our idea about sexuality is changing and evolving, this gave a lot of people uh, the opportunity as well as the safety that they needed to uh, either explore their identity and orientation or re-explore it because they never had the chance to do so before. So a lot of times when you have individuals who don't really have this clear idea of who they are sexually, and uh, partners who is going to be um, compatible with that identity orientation. Uh, they're going to be struggling into having their needs, uh, sexual needs meant for the relationship. So uh, a lot of times people resort to infidelity because they are with the wrong partner or a partner who is uh, not aligned with their sexual identity and orientation. So rather than actually uh, coming out and confronting that head on, they might be uh, tempted to try to fulfill their own sexual desires and fantasies with somebody else outside the relationship because they feel that they cannot discuss this information with their partner. Now, this is really important if they were entering a relationship under the premise of heterosexual orientation when in reality that they are bisexual or homosexual. So that's one way in which sexual identity and orientation can lead to infidelity. Now, what I'm talking about here is normal, healthy orientation identities that just have not been explored or have remained hidden. A different version of this is when you have people who have uh, sexual disorders uh, related to uh, having some kind of a paraphilic disorder or some kind of an unhealthy sexual uh, uh, desire or sexual pathology. 
those folks also tend to uh, have higher prevalence rates of infidelity because the object of their sexual desire is taboo. So, for example, we'll use somebody who is a pedophile, uh, somebody who is struggling with pedophilia, they're not going to be able to fulfill their sexual need unless they decided to become a predator and find a child victim to fulfill those needs, uh, or that they would uh, recruit the services of a sexual worker who will help play out those fantasies because they feel that they cannot bring those fantasies, fantasies to their partner because they are taboo and uh, a cause of concern. So that's one way um, sexual identity or pathological sexual identity uh, could lead to infidelity. Um, Another individual factor that can lead to infidelity is the issue of addiction. And when it comes to addiction, I'm going to talk about uh, addiction in three different layers. The first one we're going to talk about is uh, substance abuse and dependency uh, issues. Uh, remember early on in the course, we talked about uh, the fact that there's a lot of people who fantasize about infidelity, but they don't act on those fantasies because of the concerns uh, about discovery and the consequences that come out of discovery. Uh, when you have somebody who has substance abuse and dependency issues, uh, they're often going to be struggling with impaired judgment and poor impulse control because they are under the influence, which would make it easier for them to act on those fantasies uh, that they wouldn't have normally acted on because of the fear of the uh, discovery and exposure. Now, one thing I emphasize here is that just because somebody was engaged in fidelity while under the influence, it doesn't mean that the drugs or the alcohol is what made them do it. Because really, alcohol and drugs are not going to make you do something that wasn't there in the first place. So it become a catalyst for acting on those fantasies versus excusing it. So that's something really important to keep in mind when one of the individual factors that led to infidelity happen to fall under the substance abuse and dependency issue. Uh, another layer of addiction that we need to talk about is the issue of uh, uh, sex addiction. Uh, so sex addiction is actually not a diagnosable condition in the DSM-5, which is the clinical book that a clinician used to diagnose mental health issues. And this has to do with the fact that the field is split on whether or not sexual addiction uh, is something that has enough empirical data to warrant a diagnosis. But, it's, but I truly believe that uh, sex addiction is real. It's something that we witness in our personal life, people that we know, uh, sometimes uh, even on the clinical level, uh, there are a lot of people who have hypersexuality, uh, and I use the term hypersexuality uh, for the folks who uh, don't believe in the uh, addiction piece. There are a lot of people who struggle with having their thoughts predominated by sexual fantasies, and those folks tend to have higher prevalence rates of sexual infidelity because that's the nature of their clinical struggle. Uh, so that's why they end up having a higher level of uh, prevalence rates of sexual infidelity. The last piece of addiction I'm going to talk about is pornography addiction. And um, I don't really have a moral view on pornography, uh, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I mean, outside of the ethics of how pornography is being made and the abuse of uh, folks who are uh, in the industry, I really believe anything in this world can be used for good or bad. And there's a lot of research that shows healthy uh, watching of pornography can be a tool for building intimacy among couples. Uh, but this is the healthy kind of pornography viewing where it's not done in secret, where it's not uh, used as a primary way of sexual fulfillment. And that's something that's done within the consent of everybody involved. When I'm talking about pornography addiction, I'm talking about the secretive, uh, unhealthy part of pornography viewings. So how does watching pornography or pornography addiction can lead to infidelity? Uh, there's two main ways in which pornography addiction can lead to infidelity. Uh, the first one is the sexual script and changing the sexual script of the person who's watching pornography. 
Uh, when you look at the majority of the pornography materials being produced, oftentimes what's being portrayed in those sexual scenarios are things related to group sex, things related to uh, cheating on your partner, uh, pizza delivery guy, or whatever version of uh, uh, that uh, scenario. Uh, so a lot of the storylines and those pornography material is creating and igniting and amplifying fantasies about having sex with somebody who is not your partner. So that tends to affect the individual uh, sexual script and what they begin to see as something exciting and wanting to try. Another way pornography addiction can lead to infidelity is what they call the compare and contrast effect. Uh, what you will see in the pornography material, it does not mimic real life. Uh, the type of sexual activities people engaged in are not the normal garden variety um, sexual activities that normal people are engaged in, uh, but also uh, the physical attributes is exaggerated, uh, airbrushed. So it creates this uh, unattainable standard for uh, physical sexual traits that people are attracted to as well as type of sexual encounters and activities that people are attracted to. So if somebody watched pornography for the longest time, they're going to be starting to comparing their partner uh, with the people that they see in the pornography and they're going to be falling short because they're not professionals with this crew of uh, hair and makeup. Uh, they're also going to be starting to compare the type of sexual encounters that they have with their partner, and they're not going to compare well with what they see in the pornography, because in the pornography, if the script is acting as not real sexual intimacy, and that could lead them to be dissatisfied with the physical attribute of their partner, as well as the type of sexual encounters that they have with them. So that's how pornography addiction can lead to um, sexual infidelity. The last individual factor we're going to talk about in this course is exposure to uh, sexual abuse as children. Uh, and this is actually one of the most um, important pieces of research that I came across, uh, which is the relationship between getting sexually abused as a child and having higher prevalence rates of infidelity as adults. So let's talk about how can exposure to sexual abuse in childhood can lead to infidelity in adulthood. Uh, when somebody is sexually abused as a child, and, and uh, this is regardless of the length of abuse, how it was handled, uh, the relationship with the perpetrator, it end up causing short-term and long-term impact on their sexual identity and the type of sexual activities they engage in as adults. Uh, exposure to sexual abuse uh, as children is linked to risky sexual behavior as adults. And if you think about it, it actually makes sense because there's a lot of parallels between engaging in infidelity and sexual abuse as children. There is this theme of taboo, forbidden uh, desire, this dirty secrets that has to be kept hidden. Uh, so one manifestation of this I've seen in females when it comes to sexual abuse is uh, you have uh, unfaithful female partners who grow up as a result of sexual abuse, thinking that the only value that they offer to the world is through their sexuality. Uh, one of the couples that I worked with, uh, husband and wife, the wife was the unfaithful partner. Uh, she was engaged in a variety of sexual affairs online. Uh, not because there was a sexual deficit in her relationship with her husband, not because she was not attracted to her husband. Uh, she was actually uh, feeling that her emotional needs are not met, being met in the relationship, which bring up the question of, well, if, she, if her emotional needs were not being met in the relationship, why would she engage in a sexual affair with other men uh, virtually? Uh, from her perspective, she felt that the only way that men will find her valuable is by, through her, by her sexuality and her sexual attributes because the impact of the abuse that she went through as a child helped her solidify this idea of herself as a sexual object. So even though there was no sexual deficit, in order for her to get the emotional connection that she needed that was lacking in her relationship with her husband from other men outside was through 
sexual interactions because if that this is all I'm good for. The only way for me to be liked as and loved is by being a sexual object. Uh, a different manifestation of this, I say, I've seen with men who've been abused uh, as children, and oftentimes a lot of them are abused by other males, and oftentimes this creates a disruption in their sexual identity. Uh, they become conflicted about whether they're heterosexual, bisexual, or homosexual. And because of that impact, they end up growing up with an unclear or undefined sexual identity. And sometimes they try to sort through what kind of identity they have by exploring uh, other interactions, uh, same-sex interaction with other males to help them uh, tease out whether or not they're actually heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual. So that's one uh that's another main way in which sexual abuse can uh, lead to a trajectory of infidelity uh, down the road as an adult. So we spend time talking about the relationship factors that lead to infidelity as well as individual factors that could lead to infidelity. So now let's spend some time talking about the environmental and sociocultural factors. And I have to say that this category of causes of infidelity is often the most ignored by researchers as well as clinicians when it comes to uh, uh, them trying to do their assessment of why the infidelity happened. So I'm hoping that this discussion will help you uh, better understand some of the environmental factors that could either create or amplify an individual or relationship issue that lead to infidelity or create a new one. And hopefully you can actually use this information uh, to help yourself and your partner uh, capture all the different factors that lead to infidelity. Let's start with cultural norms. What are cultural norms? Cultural norms are the blueprints that we use to help us navigate uh, our social interactions with others. We all belong to different cultural groups, macro cultures, such as the case of ethnicity, religion, nationality, and microcultural groups, such as um, the type of uh, profession that we belong to or family of unit that we grew up in. Each culture that we belong to has a set of beliefs as well as uh, rules of interactions, and we usually use those beliefs and rules of interactions to help us measure what's appropriate and not appropriate to do in our immediate uh, environment as well as in uh, uh, our general interactions with others in the community. So how does cultural norms can lead to infidelity? Think of it this way, if you are part of a group in which uh, the shared belief that infidelity is not a bad thing to do or is not a frowned upon behavior, you're more likely to engage in it because it's not culturally frowned upon. This is especially true if you are part of a group in which um, engaging in fidelity is seen as a positive thing. A good example of this, uh, if you're part of a group in which uh, masculinity is seen as uh, something that should be measured off how many sexual partners a person has. Uh, people might engage in fidelity simply because that's, you know, seen as a sign of masculinity. Or if you grew up in a household in which, uh, you know, you saw your parents engage in fidelity or aunties and uncles were engaged in it, it becomes a normal behavior because this was what was modeled for you. So cultural norms is one of the main ways uh, uh, in which attitudes about infidelity are shaped, uh, which allow uh, some folks cross those lines because it's seen as something that is socially sanctioned or not frowned upon. Power disparity is also a sociological or environmental factor that could lead to emotional and sexual infidelity. Uh, what does power disparity mean? Uh, sociologists believe that all relationships have a power exchange structure. And as much as we'd like to think that all relationships are egalitarian or that, uh, you know, 
all partners in a relationship usually have the same level of power. That is not always the case. There's a lot of relationship in which one person have significantly more power than their other partner. Uh, how do these situations happen? A variety of reasons. Sometimes being born a male in a specific culture can automatically give you more power in their relationship. Sometimes it's whoever is the great uh, winner, uh, the one who has the more financial power in the relationship is the one who have the more power in the relationship dynamic. But regardless of why, you know, why would one person have more power in the relationship, when you have those type of interactions, uh, you create what they call a top dog and underdog dynamic. The top dog is the person with more power. And the top dog is going to be someone who might give themselves more rights in the relationship than the other partner simply because they can. And those rights could include playing by a different set of rules of emotional and sexual exclusivity. Also, the do top dog is going to be someone who is uh, less likely to be um, vulnerable because they associate vulnerability with weakness, um, which means that... Uh, you're going to create an environment in which it's difficult for people to express uh, needs. And when you don't express needs, those needs don't get fulfilled. Uh, when we take a look at the underdog, the person with less power in their relationship, they're going to be someone who chronically feel that they're good enough because their partner uh, is frequently reminding them of that. And nobody likes to feel that they're not good enough. Eventually, uh, this person is going to find somebody else outside the relationship who make them feel that they're good enough and make them feel that their contribution is valuable and accepted. So uh, that's how the power dynamic and the top dog and underdog dynamic could lead to infidelity uh, because of this power imbalance that could compel the top dog and the underdog to be unfaithful for uh, different reasons. Uh, last sociocultural environmental factor we're going to talk about uh, occupational stressors. Uh, we talked earlier in the course about how 36% uh, of affairs usually happen with somebody at the workplace. Um, there's a website called Ashley Madison. Uh, the website is actually designed for people who want to have affairs. I believe their tagline is, life is short, have an affair. So a few years ago, there was a data breach to that site that gave researchers a golden opportunity to analyze a large set of data about who is on this website and what kind of socioeconomic status uh, and jobs that they have. And when they did the analysis, they found out that there tend to be specific type of jobs that tends to be highly represented on this website in comparison to other jobs. So I'm going to share with you some of the uh, common jobs that were listed in that study. And these are actually the type of jobs that I encounter in my clinical practice quite often. So I'll give you the same disclaimer. Just because uh, you know somebody who has this job or you have this job doesn't mean that you're destined to be unfaithful. It just means that you have higher probability of inviting infidelity in your life due to the environmental uh, stressors related to that job. So the first job we're going to talk about is uh, people in the military. Uh, why being a member of the military increases likelihood for engaging in fidelity. Uh, one, there's the frequent deployment, which put a lot of stress on the individual as well as on the relationship, put a lot of strain. Uh, two, we have a cultural norm piece. If you ask the folks who are deployed, oftentimes uh, they are deployed in a different state, different country, which means that there is um, low risk of discovery. Your anonymity is higher. Who's going to know you're in a different state, a different country? Uh, but also, uh, it's kind of like have uh, a secret that everybody knows about, that this is what you do in your deployment. Kind of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, so if you know that your peers engage in those behaviors, you're going to be more likely to engage uh, in it. Um, so these are just some of the few reasons in which uh, being the military can be an occupational hazard for uh, inviting infidelity. Uh, 
Uh, another category is the folks who are uh, nurses, firefighters, police officers, as well as first responders. What do these guys have in common? Uh, long hours, graveyard shifts, uh, exposure to trauma, and a lot of stress on the individual mental health as well as the relationship strain. So, you know, oftentimes these guys have to have a very strong bond with their partners more than uh, other people in different kind of occupation. And uh, this has to do with the fact that the dangerous aspect of their job require them to have each other's back and have these strong bonds. But also exposure to trauma together can bond people further. So you have these people who already, uh, you know, uh, have a strong bond with one another. Uh, you have a strained relationship, they have a strained relationship. Uh, uh, they oftentimes report feeling difficulties connecting with their civilian partner at home uh, because they can't relate to the struggles that they have or maybe they can't talk to their partner because it's classified. So you already have uh, stress on the primary relationship and you have you know, a strong bond with somebody else who's going through similar things. Uh, this usually lead to blurred boundaries. The blurred boundaries eventually end up turning into emotional and sexual affairs. Uh, so that's one way uh, the occupational hazard of those type of jobs can lead to a higher likelihood of engaging in emotional and sexual infidelity. Last category I'm going to talk to you about is people who uh, works in uh, the Cooper structures and um, cutthroat industry, people who work in sales. Uh, a lot of times in these kind of environments, there's a lot of emphasis on do whatever it takes to seal the deal, which means that you might be expected to whine and dine with your clients, work with your clients just to make them happy so you can secure the account. There's also a high requirement for travel and staying away, which means that you also increase uh, reasons for being away and increase the level of anonymity. So if somebody wants to be unfaithful, they can take advantage of those business trips to hide uh, their behavior. Uh, but, but also, more importantly, sometimes the infidelity in those type of jobs happens as a mean to climb the social ladder. So quid pro quo type of dynamics. You know, you want this promotion. How bad do you want it? Uh, so even though the person might not be interested in engaging in an emotional sexual affair, but if somebody presents that to them as a way to socially climb the ladder, they might take it for that purpose. So uh, these are some of the main ways in which uh, working in that type of environment can increase one's likelihood for engaging in emotional and sexual affairs. So we talked about defining infidelity and why it's important for you and your partner to have the same agreed upon definition of the right label for the problem. Uh, we also talked about the different causes of infidelity. Uh, we looked at the relationship factors, the individual factors, as well as the socio-environmental factors. Now let's spend some time talking about uh, what does it mean to heal from infidelity, is healing possible, as well as learn about the milestones of recovery in the healing process. Uh, so healing from infidelity doesn't always mean repairing the relationship. Healing from infidelity means healing from the trauma. Why do I say this? Uh, I say this because healing is possible, but it's also based on how you define healing. Uh, there are a lot of people who are able to repair the relationship and make it better and stronger than it was prior to the discovery of the infidelity. Uh, it's hard to imagine that, uh, but I always think of infidelity like a heart attack to the relationship. Uh, that forces people to take a serious look at those individual, relational, as well as social environmental factors that they should have ad addressed prior to uh, those factors leading to infidelity. And if you think about the people who have a heart attack, uh, you know, some people take that seriously and, you know, eat uh, way better than they ever did in their whole life. They start exercising and they end up having a better overall health. Uh, and there's also the people who just kind of continue doing what they're doing and not uh, address uh, those factors that led to that crisis. 
Um, but even though those people exist, the ones who are able to repair their relationship and make it stronger and better, uh, there are a lot of people also who are not able to repair trust and uh, clean up the damage caused by the infidelity. And for those individuals, they have to consider healing uh, individually. Uh, so this is what I always recommend for my clients, uh, that you cannot just say that the only healing trajectory for me is through repairing the relationship. Uh, because if, if that was the end destination for you and your partner, trust me, you will get there, uh, but you'll get there for the right reason versus uh, doing so for the wrong reasons and out of obligations. Uh, so this is especially true when we consider that um, not everybody's going to be able to do what it takes to repair the damage and rebuild trust. Uh, my new book, Unfaithful and Unrepentant, Affairs Beyond the Hope of Affair, actually talk about the different archetype of unfaithful partners that makes it difficult for the betrayed uh, to rebuild trust. Uh, now, sometimes unfaithful partners are actually doing everything only possible to uh, make up for the damage that they have caused, as well as changing all the different factors that have led to the infidelity. But despite their best effort, uh, the betrayed is not able to rebuild trust. In those rare circumstances, uh, it's, uh, the issue here is that the betrayed was not being honest with himself about their capacity for giving for forgiving what happened. Uh, after all, we all come from different backgrounds and different worldviews. And for some of us, a uh, specific type of uh, behaviors or infidelity from our partner uh, are seen uh, unforgivable, regardless of what uh, they do after the discovery. Uh, but most often when I've seen people failing in repairing their relationship or healing together, it's usually because the unfaithful is not doing uh, what they're supposed to or not giving the betrayed uh, what they need in order for them to heal and move past this. Uh, so uh, this means we also have to accept that infidelity is a need-driven behavior in order for us to uh, change it and prevent relapse. We must uncover the underlying need driving the act. Uh, without the narrative of the affair, uh, healing cannot take place. And we're going to learn uh, more about the value of the narrative once we start talking about the milestones of recovery. Uh, so in a nutshell, the main goal of infidelity counseling should be uh, to process the trauma of the affair, which will entail giving you and your partner the opportunity to understand what happened, why it happened, assess the damage, and figure out the right trajectory of healing for the two of you. So let's switch gears and start talking about the milestones of recovery. Uh, but in order for me to talk to you about the milestone of recovery, first I have to tell you a little bit more about the systematic affair recovery therapy model and why and how it was developed. Uh, so, so many years ago when I was a younger, a younger clinician, uh, I promised myself to have the opportunity to sample uh, as many different levels of care as possible, as well as uh, have the opportunity to work with many different client populations. Why did I do this? Because I wanted to learn more about myself uh, as a therapist, my strengths and weaknesses, as well as the client uh, populations that I would be more interested in working with. So I had the luxury of, uh, you know, working at every level of care uh, that you can think of. I worked inpatient, outpatients, corrections, uh, school-based services, uh, which gave me the opportunity to work with different uh, client population. I got the opportunity to work with adults, kids, families, couples. And with each place I worked out, they usually uh, train you with the most uh, cutting edge treatment methods to serve the client population because they want you to be successful. So at the end of my internship, I realized that uh, I'm really passionate about working with couples, uh, which is unusual because a lot of uh, counselors uh, don't like working with couples because it's very challenging. But for me, it was really more suited for my skill set and uh, what I'm passionate about. And when I started having my private practice uh, that was exclusively working with couples, 
I began to notice that the majority of my clients are not usually coming in for a tune-up. They're usually coming in because they're dealing with a crisis. And uh, a large portion of those clients are coming in because they're dealing with a crisis related to uh, uh, the discovery of infidelity. So when I started looking at my extensive clinical toolbox that I have accumulated throughout the years of my internship, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what treatment method that I use for my clients, and realized that none of the clinical tools that I have accumulated over the years uh, are useful for infidelity or tailor-made for infidelity. Uh, believe it or not, even though we've been dealing with this infidelity for a long, long time, uh, up until I created the systematic of hereditary therapy model, there wasn't a treatment method that was tailor-made for infidelity. So historically, uh, therapists have been using uh, general uh, couples counseling models like uh, EFT or the Gottman methods uh, to treat infidelity. And uh, now those treatment methods uh, are were, were not designed for infidelity. They had some applications that they were able to adapt to infidelity recovery. Um, but, but again, this just was not adequate to help uh, the clients recover from this very traumatic event. And as they say, need is the mother of invention. I had this vantage point of uh, having a practice uh, working exclusively with couples. Uh, I thought that maybe I can start uh, jotting down my observation to begin solving this puzzle of infidelity recovery. And soon enough, I began to see that uh, all my clients uh, get stuck in very specific uh, areas. And this was uh, consistent regardless of what kind of clients I work with, what type of relationship they came from, uh, different cultural groups, different uh, types of relationship, they all got stuck in the same areas. Uh, so those shared universal themes that my clients have shared gave birth to the systematic affair recovery therapy model. So SART was really developed to provide counselors of all level with a strategic uh, and adaptive treatment method for helping couples heal from the trauma of emotional and sexual affairs. Uh, the model is really based on extensive clinical work with clients dealing with infidelity, as well as a comprehensive analysis of the existing body of literature about uh, how we've been uh, poorly uh, treating infidelity. So I wanted to make sure that we address the gaps and the other general treatment methods that counselors have been using. Uh, so the model is really designed to help clients appeal from the trauma of affairs, whether as couples or individuals, by completing several milestones of recovery. And those milestones are related to the shared theme that we have discussed. And the main goal was really to give the counselors the strategic blueprint that they need to help the clients heal through concrete steps and measurable outcomes. So there are seven milestones of recovery in the SART model, and we're going to go through each one of those in more details. Uh, we have setting the stage for healing, getting the story, acknowledging the impact, choosing a path, creating a plan of action, implementation and healing pains, and sustainability. So let's take a look at the first milestone, which is setting the stage for healing. So the clinical objective for this milestone is really to help you and your partner create the optimal environment for recovery. How do we do that? Uh, the first important step to create this optimal environment of recovery is to help you and your partner agree on very important logistics. Uh, first one of them is whether or not we should live together or live separately. So my recommendation for folks while they're trying to go the, through the therapy process is to do this while they're living under the same roof instead of living separately. Uh, as long as they're able to do so while being emotionally and physically safe. Uh, physically safe is somewhat easier to wrap our mind around. Physical safety is assessed by, you know, the risk for domestic violence, uh, history of abuse, things along those lines. Emotional safety is a little bit difficult to quantify. Emotional safety doesn't mean everybody's happy and not sad. Uh, or that there are no intense emotions. Uh, you can have intense emotion because you're dealing with a traumatic event. Emotional safety is 
really measured by whether or not you and your partner have access to emotionally safe zones if things are escalating or if the intensity of the emotion is getting to be too high. Uh, meaning, uh, are you and your partner able to take a break from this intensity and not further traumatize one another and allow for space to prevent escalation? Why do I recommend for people to stay under the same house ha household while they go through this process? Uh, a lot of reasons, but I'll share with you the two main ones. Uh, one, after the discovery of infidelity, uh, trust is out of the window. So the last thing that I want for the betrayed to worry about is what's going on uh, with the unfaithful. Are they seeing the third party? Third party is the term that I use to describe the affair partner. Uh, so we want to minimize uh, uh, the additional stress for the betrayed to deal with during this difficult time. Another important reason uh, to do this is to uh, for the betrayed to know that they're not alone and isolated in dealing with this trauma uh, because the betrayed needs to see how is the unfaithful is being impacted by this are they having the appropriate feelings of guilt and shame are they uh, worried about the future of the relationship or are they indifferent or are they you know excited about the discovery because all this information is going to help um, the betrayed as well as the unfaithful decide whether or not repairing is the right option uh, another important logistic to help you and your partner agree on is minimizing outsider influence. Uh, it is not uncommon for uh, the betrayed to want to reach out after the discovery of infidelity to family members, friends, uh, spiritual leaders, um, sometimes uh, their own kids. Uh, it is important to minimize uh, the number of people who are exposed to the discovery of infidelity in a perfect world. You really need to keep the knowledge about the discovery of infidelity between you and your partner and the professionals that you hire to help the two of you sort through this. Why do I say this? Uh, because you don't want the decision that you and your partner are going to make about this future relationship is going to be influenced by external factors. A lot of times, uh, you know, uh, I, I hear the thread says, but yeah, but I need to talk to so-and-so because I need to process uh, or I need to get their advice because they've gone through something similar. Yes, it is important to have the need to process and you cannot process with your partner who has been the source of your pain. That's what individual therapy is for. But also getting advice from somebody that you know, you're also going to be soliciting their bias uh, because whatever decision that you make about staying or leaving, you're not going to go back and explain to them why you made those decisions. So I've seen a lot of people who stay in their relationship for the wrong reason because of outside influence. And I've seen people leave for also uh, because of external uh, factors for the wrong reasons. We want to make sure that whatever decision the two of you make is really internally motivated uh, for the right reasons. It's also important to not involve your kids in this. And I say kids, whether they are children or adults, uh, research shows that exposing kids to parental infidelity can lead to a lot of short-term and long-term damage. Uh, this is especially for the kids who are younger. You don't want them to be stuck uh, as the go in between uh, you and your partner. It's not fair for them. Uh, if they have siblings, this might affect the relationship among siblings because not everybody's going to choose to support the same part, uh, the same parent. And also, it can negatively influence their idea about relationship in the future and the type of value that they have for uh, fidelity. Uh, also, minimizing outsider influence includes uh, not reaching out to the third party. A lot of times, the betrayed want to reach out to the third party, and they do it for a variety of reasons. Sometimes, the betrayed want to reach out to the third party to get more information about the story because the unfaithful is being dishonest, or the, they're not believing what the unfaithful is saying. 
So the problem here, when you try to get the story from the third party, you have to take whatever information they give you with a grain of salt because they have their own motivation for being involved in the affair. This is assuming that they knew that the unfaithful was in a committed relationship. Uh, I've seen a lot of third parties who exaggerate what happened and making it worse than what it actually is. And I've also seen a lot of third parties who minimize um, what happened and whitewash it. So really nothing good is going to come out of that. Uh, sometimes the betrayed want to reach out to the third party because they want to set some limit. They want to express how angry and upset and hurt they are. Or they want to tell them, leave my man alone or leave my woman alone. Uh, even though uh, there is validity of wanting to set those limits, I have yet to see somebody able to do this in a way that was appropriate and did not invite more problems. Remember when we said a lot of times uh, affairs happen in the workplace, uh, there are a lot of times where, you know, reaching out to the third party create this chain reactions of HR problems, legal problems. I've seen people who get sued uh, because uh, continuing to bring the third party and the third party's family into the drama of discovery. So you have to think about the big picture um, that reaching out to third party may feel on an impulsive level that it will give you some peace but it's going to create more problems down the road another important step to help you and your partner create the optimal environment for recovery is um, to anticipate and prepare for the challenges of the recovery process so the first challenge that i try to prepare my clients for is the challenge of what i'd like to call the bipolar nature of healing uh, what do i mean by this uh, if we actually try to track uh, the recovery process during uh, clients' time in treatment while they're trying to navigate those small zones of recovery, uh, it's going to look something like this, right? You see, you know, we have some good days, bad days. I love you, I hate you, stay, leave. So it looks pretty chaotic if you're in the middle of it. And a lot of times when people are going through this, they're in the middle of the storm, they might feel that they're not getting any better. But in reality, when you take a look at the emotional stability, even though it's chaotic up and down, it's actually going up and eventually it evens out. Uh, why does the recovery process look like this? Because infidelity recovery is not a linear process. Uh, with each bullet dot here, there is a new discovery. There is a new pocket of intense emotion. There is some unpleasant truth to confront and discover, uh, as well as struggle in making the changes uh, that have led to the affair. So you need to remember that, uh, you know, just because you're having a good day or a bad day uh, and that it is, the emotional stability seems to be chaotic, it does not mean it's not getting better. It will even out as you allow it time, uh, especially if the two of you are engaged in a process that help the two of you get unstuck uh, uh, from uh, the, the, the challenges of each milestone. Another challenge that you need to prepare for is the challenge of living a normal life during abnormal times. Um, just because you're dealing with a traumatic event, life is not going to take a break. Yeah, you know, you still have to be dealing with kids, work, uh, chores, responsibilities. So you need to remind yourself that uh, all the different areas in your life are going to be impacted because you're dealing with a traumatic event. So you're not going to be 100% in those areas and that's okay because this is not forever. This is the time where you need to lean in on your support system uh, to help uh, you and your partner carve out the time and energy needed to engage in therapeutic services so that you can start healing. Uh, and if you don't have a support system, this would be the time to start uh, building a support system. Now, if you're asking family or friends for help uh, or babysitting because you need to go to counseling, they don't need to know the nitty gritty about what's going on, right? Uh, they just need to know that you need help. You can share high level information, but remember, we want to uh, minimize outsider influence. Uh, another important step to achieve this optimal environment for recovery is to seek professional help. Uh, a lot of times, couples make the mistake of uh, trying to recover from infidelity on their own. Um, this is one of those complicated issues that a simple self help book is not going to actually. Uh, allow you to fix those issues. It's like trying to do surgery on yourself. 
this is one of those uh, issues that you really need uh, the help for qualified uh, specialized individuals. Uh, so not only couple need to consider specialized in fidelity recovery couples counseling, but also they should be engaged in individual counseling. What would be the value in individual counseling? From the betrayed perspective, you're going to be dealing with a lot of trauma, you're going to have a lot of PTSD symptoms, and you need to be seeing a trauma specialist who can help you uh, deal with the triggers, who can help you with dealing with uh, the imageries that you have in your head as a result of the discovery. For the individual counseling, I recommend uh, seeing a trauma specialist, somebody who is trained in EMDR or brain spotting. Uh, for the unfaithful, uh, it is important uh, for the unfaithful to be seeking individual counseling, especially if they uh, some of the main factors that led to infidelity were individual issues related to mental health issues related to porn addiction, sex addiction, uh, unprocessed past trauma. Whatever individual issues that have led to the infidelity, they need to be uh, dealt with on a separate track with individual therapy. Uh, family counseling is going to be necessary if you and your partner made the mistake of exposing the kids to uh, the discovery of the infidelity. If that happened, you need to make sure that your kids are actually adjusting well to this major trauma and they're not being impacted negatively long-term as a result of exposing them to the discovery. Uh, when it comes to group therapy, uh, my hope down the road is to build a systematic affair recovery therapy model uh, for groups. Uh, this is in the making, it's not, uh, it hasn't been uh, fully created and tested yet. Uh, so what you will find when it comes to group therapy related to infidelity, there are a lot of groups online uh, that you can find some validation and support of people going through the same experience. Here's the downside. Um, be selective on what kind of uh, groups that you're attending, whether in person or virtually. Uh, not all of them are going to be giving you good advice. Not all of them are guided by a clinical process. So please be selective of what kind of group format uh, you are going to be engaged in and check with your individual and couples therapist about the appropriateness of this uh, group format and whether or not it's actually going to be conducive for the healing process. Uh, it is important for all the different therapists that you have to be able and willing to communicate with one another because we want to make sure that all these different specialists are working toward the same goal versus stepping over each other's uh, uh, clinical uh, lines of parameters. So the second milestone of the recovery process is the milestones of getting the story. The clinical objective here to discover the story of the affair and I have to say, this milestone is the most important as well as the most difficult milestone of the whole recovery process. Uh, if this milestone is done, not done correctly, it's going to be difficult for you and your partner to heal from the infidelity. Because how can you choose a destination of healing when you don't really know what happened and why it happened? So uh, the first step that we need to do to achieve uh, this clinical objective is to help you and your partner create a safe environment for proactive transparency. This uh, will entail having an opportunity to make very important agreements to help you and your partner do this part successfully. So there are three agreements we're going to talk about. Uh, the scope of use agreements, the feeling exploration and management agreement, as well as accepting outcome agreements. So on the intellectual level, both the betrayed and the unfaithful are able to wrap their mind on the idea that we need to get the story of uh, the what happened and why it happened and uh, understand how on an intellectual level that this can help the two of them make an informed decision. But it's a lot more challenging to do in reality because usually there's a lot of anxiety about uh, telling the story and discovering the story. And these agreements that I have just shared with you are the agreements that we need to make to help manage uh, some of the anxieties that could get in the way of uh, having a clear narrative of uh, what type of fidelity took place 
and why it happened. So uh, the scope of use agreement is usually an agreement that we have to make to help address uh, the concern that the unfaithful have about telling the story. A lot of times the unfaithful partner uh, wants to tell you what happened or why it happened, uh, but uh, they are concerned about how is the information they're going to be shared is going to be uh, used or abused down the road. So the unfaithful says, I want to tell you the, the lie, but I need to make sure that you won't use this information against me. Uh, you don't use it against me by uh, sharing with the kids. You don't use it against me by going after the third party or by blasting all this information in social media. Uh, so the agreement that we have to make, that whatever we share about the story, it's used for the single purpose of helping the two of you heal. No more, no less. And this is an agreement I even make with my clients uh, before I take them on. Uh, the whole purpose of therapy is to help the two of you get unstuck. It's not to create ammunition for the two of you to fight uh, each other and use that ammunition for uh, custody battles or divorce proceeding down the roads. So we all have to make the agreement that we're going to use this information uh, properly for the purpose of healing. The feeling exploration and management agreement, this has to do with the anxiety that the unfaithful have about um, the emotional impact that will be caused by sharing the what and the why. Uh, usually the unfaithful says, I don't want to hurt my partner by telling them the story. And my rebuttal is that, you know, it's a little bit too late. If you didn't want to hurt them, you shouldn't have crossed the lines of fidelity. And uh, now you have an opportunity to uh, minimize their pain by using this opportunity to lay all the cards on the table and tell us the what and the why so that we can actually uh, help process those feelings. Or you could make their feelings uh, of pain and hurt worse by continuing to lie to them or doing something more devastating, which is giving the truth by a dropper. Uh, obviously, that's not really the route that we want to go. So the agreements that we have to make. Yes, telling the story is going to be painful. It's going to be painful to say and it's painful to hear, but it's a necessary evil. There is no way around it. Yes, it's going to cause intense feelings of hurt, anger, sadness, fear. Uh, that's okay as long as we manage those feelings in a healthy way that can facilitate healing versus making things worse. Third agreement that we have to make to create the safe environment for practical transparency is accepting the outcomes agreement. And uh, this usually has to do with uh, the unfaithful concern about what if I share what happened or why it happened and is going to cause the betrayed not to want to rebuild the relationship with me. And my rebuttal to that is that if what you did and why you did it was going to be a deal breaker for your partner to repair the relationship, it's going to be a deal breaker today. It's going to be a deal breaker five years or 10 years from now. So why waste everybody's time by delaying the inevitable? Uh, this is especially true when considering that nothing stay hidden forever. So if you, you know, change some key component aspect of the story just to avoid your partner saying no for rebuilding, eventually you're going to get to that uh, at some point of time because truth has a funny way of coming back to the surface. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're not wasting any more time, as well as uh, causing the betrayed to be further uh, tricked and misguided by leaving out or changing important component of the story. Another important step in this milestone is the suspension of disbelief. Um, so, the betrayed would like to get the story directly from the source, which is the unfaithful, but they have this challenge uh, called the challenge of the boy who cried wolf dilemma. How is it uh, possible for the betrayed to believe what the unfaithful is saying? Because remember, in order for infidelity to happen, it cannot happen without the element of deceit. So the credibility of the unfaithful is already shot. So the, what, what I tell my uh, clients that trade on the unfaithful is that let's give the unfaithful the opportunity to tell the story. 
uh, let allow me as a clinician to ask any questions uh, I need to ask to help me establish sequence of events and uh, to help us identify the main components of the narrative. And uh, as the betrayed, you have every right to ask any questions that you want, uh, but we need to make sure they are going to be good questions that would help us uh, heal versus add additional trauma. And we're going to talk about what that means when we get to the controlling the content of the story portion of this milestone. So we have to make the promise that we will get the story and we have to put uh, the story of what the unfaithful shared to the test of logic. It's either they're going to be able to provide a narrative that makes sense uh, or not. Uh, and also, we have to keep in mind that we don't only just have the test of logic. Oftentimes, there are some information that has been discovered, such as text, emails, messages, pictures. Um, you know, we put all that information together to see if we have a logical narrative that help us explain how and why this happened. That is the next best thing to the truth uh, that we can get to. I you know sometimes I worked with clients who uh, had their partners take a, a polygraph test and uh, you know that thought they're being honest but the, the, the problem is that really we don't have the technology yet to see if somebody is telling the truth beyond a shadow of a doubt. So that's why you have to rely on uh, really the logic of the information that's being shared and to what extent that narrative actually makes sense based on what you know about yourself, what you know about your partner, what you know about your relationship. Uh, because even if we had 24-7 footage and audio recording of what took place, that's still not going to tell us everything because it does not capture thoughts and feelings. Uh, it can be uh, misinterpreted out of context. That's why really the best source of getting the narrative is the unfaithful, hence highlighting the necessity of really seeing uh, the value of giving the true narrative versus minimizing it or uh, whitewashing it. This brings us to the step of controlling the content of the story. Um, so usually, when I'm helping my clients with this milestones, uh, there, there's two competing forces in the room. There is the need to exaggerate the narrative and there is the need to minimize the narrative. The need to exaggerate the, exaggerate the narrative is usually happening from the betrayed ends and this is just a normal reaction to trauma. You know, if uh, I discovered that my partner is unfaithful and this is something I never saw coming, I'm going to be questioning everything. So to prepare myself for the worst, I'm going to imagine the worst. And that will cause me to try to want to exaggerate what happened. Because how do I know that this is the extent of what my partner did? The need to minimize is uh, usually done by the unfaithful. And that faithful want to minimize the story or the narrative for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because they want to avoid uh, the intensity of the guilt and shame that they should be feeling. Sometimes it's because, uh, you know, I feel that if I minimize what happened, this will increase my chances of uh, having my partner want to rebuild the relationship. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, to try to protect uh, the betrayed from more hurt and pain. Uh, they feel that if they minimize the what and the why, maybe it will be less painful for the betrayed partner. So the job of the counselor is to help um, both clients discover the story while balancing between these two opposing forces. And it's uh, not an easy process to do, hence the need for seeing a specialist who really can help the two of you find the balance between uh, exaggerating and minimizing because we really want the accurate narrative versus an exaggerated version of it or a whitewash version of it. Uh, another important step in determining uh, or controlling the content of the story is to determine the appropriate level of disclosure. So clinicians are split on this space. If you ask uh, counselors about how much information should be shared. You'll have some counselors who would say, uh, you know, no information should be shared because if you share information, is going to add more trauma to the betrayed 
you have some counselor who says, well, you need to share everything, uh, big or small, uh, the betrayed have the right to know everything that they need to know. To me, uh, there is no right or wrong answer that will work for everybody. So I really believe the appropriate level of disclosure is going to be based on case by case uh, and each client unique on needs because there is such a thing as sharing unnecessary, unnecessary information that would lead to more trauma and more rumination and more images in the betrayed heads. And also you can make an argument if you just really share the bare minimum or you share a story that doesn't make sense, you can have the betrayed being stuck for eternity trying to make sense of something that's just not adding up. Uh, so bringing this back to how I do it, as I mentioned before, I told that faithful, you have an opportunity to tell the story. I'm going to ask you questions as the clinicians to help me establish sequence of events. And I told the betrayed, you have every right to ask any questions that you want to ask. But we have to make a calling. Is this a good question or a bad question? So what is the rule to determine a good question or a bad question? A good question is a question in which the answer for will give you uh, information that will help you identify the type of infidelity that took place and the reason why it happened. If you can make a case for why the answer, why the questions that you're asking will yield such answer, then it's a good question to ask. If you're not able to make a case for it, then it's probably a bad question to ask. So interestingly enough, when you allow the betray to go through this analysis about which question they're asking and why they're asking it, you will find out that a lot of times the betrayed actually have a legitimate reason for asking their questions. They just don't really know how to get to this legitimate need outside of asking that question. If you ask them to reflect on the why, you'll be able to help them as a clinician to, uh, you know, get the information that they need maybe without asking for that kind of question that will add, that, that will have more uh, unnecessary images or details. Uh, and, and really just can help redirect uh, that into a healthier trajectory that will actually help both couple have uh, a better understanding clarity on the one and the why versus just emotionally reacting to one another. So but to put this to the test, what like so let's say appropriate level of disclosure. Let's say you are dealing with a sexual affair and you have the betrayed uh, wanting to know what kind of sexual activities happen between the unfaithful and the third party. Is this a good question to ask? Is what's the appropriate level of disclosure here? Is that something that the unfaithful should answer? Uh, my answer would be uh, yes or no based on the situation. Well, what does this mean? So let's say the sexual affair was caused by an individual issue that's related to sex addiction. In this scenario, it doesn't really matter what kind of sexual activity that the unfaithful and the third party were engaged in. Not really, because this was not a compatibility issue. This was an individual issue related to addiction. So that level of detail is not really necessary to add uh, more value to the narrative of the affair. Now, if we are dealing with a sexual affair and the cause of the sexual affair is a relationship factor to compatibility issue, then it's a fair question to ask because as the betrayed, I want to know how how am I not compatible with you? What did the other person have that was more compatible with what you wanted? But even then, when there is a solid case for an answering such a difficult question, it doesn't. The answer doesn't need to be in technical color, colors, and you still be at the lowest level of disclosure because we want to make sure that we're not further traumatizing the betrayed by adding unnecessary images in their head. So really what I want you to think about this piece, if there is limit about the level of disclosure, it's not because, you know, uh, the betrayed is not owed that. It's not a matter of what you're owed. It's a matter of, you know, is what you're owed is going to help you or hurt you further, right? And that's what I'm saying, focus on information that help you understand the what and the why because that's really the whole purpose of getting the narrative. Lastly, it is important when uh, the narrative 
of the infidelity is clear and is agreed upon by everyone. Uh, both partners need to move forward and make a conscious choice that they are done with this story and move on to the uh, next milestones of recovery. Why do I say this? Because a lot of times people get stuck in this phase. Uh, they, you know, they end up just having many, many rounds of interrogations and tell me again why you did this and tell me again in this different way. And, and usually that happens when people really try to do this on their own and they either get uh, a narrative that doesn't make sense or they get a whitewashed narrative. Uh, and sometimes they get stuck in this cycle for a long, long time. And what happens when you're just asking and re-asking? Uh, eventually memory degrade, eventually the narrative is going to change and you have people just end up feeling that the unfaithful is just uh, not being honest about what's going on. Now sometimes that is the case because they didn't have a clear narrative or they didn't give uh, a narrative that wasn't whitewashed, but sometimes it's just really uh, the betrayed have not learned different ways to get the information that they want or they have got the information that they want and they don't have different ways of dealing with triggers. And the only way for them to deal with the triggers is by revisiting the story, which is really not very helpful because if you really got the narrative, don't ask questions that you already know, know the answer for. Uh, if you're dealing with a trigger, uh, what needs to happen is to actually identify what you need from the faithful partner in this moment of time. And revisiting the story, uh, it's not going to give you, it's not going to give them a pathway in the present to help you with this trigger because anything related to the past, then faithful is always going to fail because they were unfaithful. They already cheated and that bill has already been rung and cannot be unrunged by revisiting the story. So the third milestone in the recovery process is acknowledging the impact. The clinical objective is to acknowledge and articulate the impact of infidelity. Uh, acknowledging the impact of infidelity is important for uh, a lot of reasons. The first one is going to be an opportunity for the unfaithful to provide validation and empathy. Uh, it's also an opportunity to take accountability for the reasons why the infidelity happened. Uh, now, here's, a, here's an important part because remember when we said the story is going to help us identify the what and the why. Uh, let's say some of those why uh, the infidelity happened is related to a relationship deficit or uh, needs that were not being met by the betrayed partners. It is an opportunity to take accountability for those relationship deficits that have led to the affair. But I need to emphasize here too, is that again, taking accountability for the relationship deficit should not be confused for taking accountability for the affair because the unfaithful is 100% responsible on how they chose to act on those relationship deficits. As I said before, even if you have the worst partner in the universe, if they're not meeting your needs, you have options. You can take them to counseling to talk about those needs before you cross the lines of fidelity, or you can leave the relationship before you cheat. So the accountability here is an acknowledgement of the relationship deficit, but not taking accountability for the act of uh, infidelity. They're two separate things. Um, being able to acknowledge the impact of infidelity is going to allow uh, the betrayed to see if the unfaithful is able to understand the scope of the damage that they have caused on every different level, uh, the emotional impact of infidelity, the physical impact of infidelity, how the infidelity uh, is uh, creating this anxiety and fear about the future, uh, how does the discovery of infidelity have impacted the betrayed uh, social life, did it cause them to be isolated, causing them to feel uh, alone and embarrassed because they don't want to go out and have people uh, know that this happened. So here's an opportunity for the unfaithful to truly demonstrate, do they get the damage that they have caused in all the different areas of life and the betrayed part? Uh, and also uh, helping the betrayed and the unfaithful uh, have, take the time to really understand the damage caused by the infidelity can actually help 
provide context of how they're currently interacting with one another as a result of the discovery. So classic example that I see all the time, uh, I hear the betrayed complaints about the unfaithful engagement in the process. So sometimes the betrayed says, I feel that the unfaithful doesn't really care about what they did. Um, and I say, like, why do you say that? They said, well, every time I want to talk about uh, the infidelity, uh, they shut down the conversation, uh, they get overwhelmed, and uh, and I feel like they do this because they're not really sorry about what they did. When you ask the unfaithful, like, does this happen? They say, yes, the, interact the observation of the betrayals are accurate, but their interpretation of why I do this is inaccurate. And when you ask them to elaborate, they say, yes, I do shut down. I try to end those conversations when they happen, not because I don't feel bad, not because I don't get uh, the damage that I cause. I do it because the guilt and the shame uh, that I'm feeling when confronting my action is making me feel this way. So when I shut the conversation down, this is me trying to uh, avoid having those feelings. Now, the good news, being able to understand why this happens is going to actually create a pathway for helping people change their perspective about why their partner is interacting this way. Because if I was the betrayed, it is important for me to see whether or not the unfaithful have empathy, whether or not they actually get the damage that they have caused. Because why would I want to rebuild or live with somebody who did, did all this damage and, and they still don't get it? Uh, but if we identified that this is just a reaction, a reflection of how they're dealing with guilt and shame, now we can say, great, it's good that you have guilt and shame, but we cannot deal with the guilt and shame by escaping it. You cannot uh, shut down the conversation because you're uncomfortable with those feelings. You need to actually allow yourself to experience those feelings because it's a teachable moment uh, so that you can actually allow yourself to kind of uh, redeem uh, all yourself from all these individual issues that have allowed you to make the decision to be unfaithful. Um, it's also important in this milestones to uh, help uh, unfaithful showcase uh, their understanding of the impact of infidelity through articulating this by providing a sincere apology as well as identifying uh, what's needed from one another to deal with this impact. Uh, a lot of times prior to people showing up to counseling, uh, the betrayed might have received a lot of apologies from the unfaithful, but many of them uh, didn't really stick. And the reason they don't stick because oftentimes they're reactionary. I'm sorry that you found out. I'm sorry that you're hurt. Uh, but it's a different apology when you actually specifically apologize for the damage that your action have caused. Uh, it's different between say, sorry I, I, I cheated versus sorry that because of my infidelity you are struggling uh, with your sense of self. Uh, Sorry that because of my infidelity, now you having to be someone who have to check on my phone all the time when you didn't use to do this before. I'm sorry that because of my infidelity, you know, you can't uh, hang out with your friends because you're worried that, you know, every time you get together with them that you're going to drop the mask and spill the beans and tell them everything that's going on. So it's more meaningful to provide an apology that correlates with the specific damage was caused because from the betrayed perspective it will have more value and ring true versus this just generic apology that is uh, reactionary. Uh, it's also important in this milestone to help both partners identify what's needed from one another uh, to deal with all of this damage and all of this impact. And again, that doesn't mean that we have chosen a path of recovery, that this is uh, the unfaithful opportunity to begin to clean the mess they have created, regardless of whether or not it's going to allow them to repair the relationship with their partner. The fourth milestone of recovery is choosing a path. The clinical objective in this milestone is to help the clients choose a path of recovery. Uh, because as we have talked about this earlier, uh, healing from infidelity doesn't always mean repairing the relationship. It could mean healing individually or healing together. 
Uh, the first step to achieve this clinical objective is to help the clients identify the obstacles that's preventing them from choosing a path. And usually people kind of like at the fork in the road, you know, do I rebuild this relationship or do I uh, heal individually? And I always kind of emphasize that uh, not all unfaithful partners after the discovery are sure about rebuilding. So the decision of rebuilding uh, or healing individually is a decision that both the betrayed and the unfaithful have to make. Uh, and sometimes when people are stuck in this middle of the road, they there are obstacles that are preventing them from even entertaining choosing a path. And the reason why I give the path analogy is that just because you choose a path, you're not stuck with it. If you choose the path and you take a step, and you're not liking this road that you're on, you can always go back and choose a different path. Uh, the obstacles are going to be different person to person, uh, couple to couple, as well as from different vantage point of the betrayed or the unfaithful. Common example um, that I have uh, seen for the uh, unfaithful partner to say, what if we choose the path of rebuilding and I do all the work and despite my best effort uh, that I will not be forgiven and we will not be uh, past this. We're not going to be able to heal the relationship. I think that's a valid, legitimate obstacles. And my rebuttal to that one is, yes, that's a possibility, but the only way to find out is by actually taking the time to see if the two of you can repair this and it may lead to healing and having a stronger and better relationship or it may lead to finding out that what happened is unforgivable but you cannot uh, come to that conclusion um, without actually uh, being on that path and trying it uh, another common obstacle uh, on the betrayed end uh, what if i choose uh, to heal together and, and people think poorly of me because you have all these people who knew about the infidelity and they're going to think I'm a doormat for choosing to stay in this relationship. Also valid obstacle, hence the need to prevent how many people need to know about this so that you're not influenced by uh, their reaction when, you, when you're ready to make a choice. Uh, my rebuttal to that one is that you cannot live your life based on other people's judgment because those who are judging you on the side whether they're judging you for staying or leaving uh, they're doing this from a distance so it's easy for everybody to uh, pass judgment when it's not their life you're going to be the only one who is dealing with the successes or failures of your choices so you should be making this choice for yourself versus for others so that's the the, the first important step is to really for that counselor to help both the betrayed and the unfaithful identify what are the obstacles that are getting in the way of choosing a path and helping them create some safeguards against those obstacles so they can actually begin choosing a path. Uh, then people usually ask, so Dr. Al-Salim, how do you help people uh, choose a path of recovery? The first thing that I need to say, that is not the therapist's job to choose for you. It is the therapist's job to give the two of you the information that you need to help you make that decision. So I'm gonna share with you the three areas of assessment that I help my clients go through uh, to help you kind of understand how to go about this process with your partner and your therapist. So the first important uh, area of assessment that people need to go through is assessing the relationship history to prior to the affair. And there is uh, three categories uh, of couples. There is the one who had it and lost it. There is the one who never had it in the first place. And there is a hybrid group that's somewhere in between. Now, all of these categories can be good candidates for choosing the path of rebuilding the relationship. But it's at a different level of success. Uh, the least successful of rebuilding the relationship are the ones who never had it in the first place. 
uh, the most successful ones in rebuilding the relationship is the one who had it and lost it. What do I mean by this? Uh, so the one who had it and lost it, these are the couple who can recall a time of the relationship where the relationship was healthy, where the relationship was meeting uh, both partner needs, but then life happened and they dealt with individual and relationship issues that ended up leading to a fair. The one who never had in the first place, these are the couple who started the relationship for the wrong reason. Uh, relationship was bad day from day one, and infidelity is just the icing on the cake. Uh, the one who had it and lost it are better candidates because uh, it is in their best interest to uh, work hard on the relationship because there is something that's worth saving. And also there is muscle memory. There used to be a time where the relationship was healthy and successful. The one who never had it in the first place, it's a significant struggle for them because what is the incentive for both parties to rebuild a broken relationship that now has the additional layer of lack of trust? And also there is no muscle memory. So the hybrid group, these are the one who can recall a positive, healthy foundation in the relationship, but it wasn't, you know, it didn't last long, like the dysfunction that they experienced started way earlier in the relationship. And that's why they kind of have the uh, somewhere in between uh, uh, level of success uh, as candidates for building the relationship. Uh, another area of assessment that I encourage my clients to go through to choose a path is uh, the type of the affair and the actual uh, reasons behind it. And uh, for this area of assessment, there is no right or wrong answers. It just uh, people will view about what they seem forgivable and not, and people will view about what they're willing and not willing to work with when it comes to repair. Uh, for example, when it comes to the type of infidelity, some people are willing to forgive uh, emotional affairs and not sexual affairs. Others might feel differently. Uh, as far as the actual causes of the affair, uh, as we have mentioned earlier, the cause of the fear can be individual, relational, or uh, socio-environmental, or a combination of all three. Um, how much of those factors or relationship and individual reason can be a potential deal breaker for uh, some couples? For example, we'll, we'll use the we'll use the sexual affair example. Let's say you have sexual affair, and sexual affair was caused by individual issue related to sex addiction. Some betrayed might say, okay, this is good news. It's not personal, it's not a compatibility thing. You know, if we get my partner the help that he or she needs, then maybe this won't happen again. Uh, other betrayed might feel different. Might They might feel like, I don't want to work with somebody who had infidelity because of individual issue, because how do I know that the unfaithful is going to take their individual recovery seriously? Yeah, they can go to counseling, but how do I know if they're actually managing it? So they will be less likely to want to rebuild because they have no control over this uh, if it was uh, uh, in comparison to if it was a relationship uh, factor. Now we'll use the same example. Let's say that it was a sexual infidelity uh, that was caused by a relationship factor related to compatibility. You had one person who identifies as vanilla and the other person who identifies as somebody in the king community. Um, some betrayeds might feel comfortable in uh, working on this because they feel, okay, maybe this is a compatibility issue that there is room for middle ground. Others, uh, it might be a deal breaker because the compatibility issue is something that doesn't lend itself to having a middle ground. Uh, and, and this again highlight why getting the story of the type of infidelity or why it happened uh, as a crucial component of the recovery process because it's going to help people uh, uh, have uh, the information that they need to make an informed decision. The last piece area of assessment that the couples need to go through is how did they do, how did they do in the previous milestones of recovery? How did the couple do in uh, getting the story and acknowledging the impact and setting the stage uh, for healing. So rebuilding a relationship after infidelity require a lot of emotional dexterity and require a lot of work. 
And if people are failing in the previous milestones of recovery, they're not going to have the emotional dexterity and the uh, abilities needed to rebuild trust because rebuilding trust is going to require a lot of work. So we'll start with um, the milestones of the story and, and why is it important for people to succeed or fail in that. Um, what I look for as success or failure in getting the story uh, milestone is seeing is the unfaithful is going to be open? Are they going to be transparent? Are they going to be uh, willing to share some unpleasant truth to help us understand the type of infidelity that happened or why it happened? Because if they're failing in doing that, then guess what? They're not going to have what it takes to actually do the other work needed to rebuild trust. So it is important for them during this critical time to uh, pass. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about on when how couple decided to do this on their own. It's how uh, are they doing this while they're engaged in therapy? Because uh, I can tell you for a fact that 99.9% .9 of the unfaithful when the affair is being discovered, they are uh, not successful in telling uh, the true narrative because of all the different factors that we have discussed before. What I'm talking about is that the lines start once you engage in a therapy process. If the unfaithful is still not taking advantage of that and shying away from telling the story, then that's a clear indication that they're not willing to give the betrayed what they need to heal. Uh, also, what I look for here too is uh, sometimes the unfaithful is actually telling you the story and the story is logical and making sense. I'm trying to see if the the trade is willing to accept the story. And when I say accept, it doesn't mean I'm saying that they would say it's okay. What I'm saying is that are they willing to wrap their mind around here is why the infidelity happened. Uh, because if they're struggling in accepting a logical narrative, then they're not going to be able to move forward because we have to have a narrative uh, to help us decide whether we're going to rebuild or not. And if the two of you are going to rebuild, uh, we have to agree on why this happened so they can fix those issues. Um, so long story short, failing to get the story, give the story, or accept the story uh, will uh, prevent people from entertaining the possibility of rebuilding a relationship as a potential option, but also it's going to take away from the clarity that they need to move on individually as well. Uh, let's talk a little bit about acknowledging the impact. Why is it important for the unfaithful to be successful in demonstrating that they acknowledge the impact of infidelity. So what I look for is, um, are they able to get the scope intellectually? Are they able to see all the different areas that was damaged by their action? Uh, and also, not just uh, on the intellectual level, are they going to have the appropriate feelings associated with that understanding? Meaning, uh, there are a lot of unfaithful partners who not only they don't get the damage that they caused, but sometimes they get the damage and they don't feel about it. They can sit there and tell you all the different areas that have destroyed the trade life, uh, but they almost seem to be apathetic about it. Like, so what? I did that. I don't feel bad about it. That's a different kind of problem because as the betrayed, why would you want to rebuild a relationship with somebody who doesn't get the damage that they have caused or, or they get the damage, but they don't have the right feelings associated with that understanding? That means that they're going to be... Uh, rebuilding a relationship with a sociopath, which is just a setup for failure. Uh, so so uh, these are the three main area of assessment that I encourage uh, couples to go through in order for them to help choose a path. So the relationship history prior to the affair, the type and actual causes of affair, and how they do in the previous mouth sounds of recovery. Let's take a look at the fifth milestone, which is creating a plan of action. The clinical objective here is to create a plan of action to either separate or rebuild the relationship. Uh, in order for people to decide to come up with a plan of action to rebuild the relationship, we need a consensus of choices. What this means is that you have to have both partners uh, willing to explore the path of rebuilding because if you have one person who says, yes, I want to explore it, another person saying, no, they're not ready, then it's a no. Uh, it's also important to clarify the true motive 
behind the choice to separate or rebuild the relationship. Uh, like I said, there are a lot of times where people choose a path for the wrong reasons. Um, why is it important to have the right reason for choosing a path? Uh, because whether or not you choose to rebuild a relationship or heal individually, both of those choices are going to be difficult choices to make. And in order for you to stay the course, you have to have good reason for making that decision so that you can survive the challenges associated with the path that you have chosen. Uh, when it comes to rebuilding the relationship, a lot of times people want to rebuild because they don't want to avoid divorce or they don't want to deal with custody issues or it's uh, you know fear of moving on uh, or maybe they can, are not financially independent. Now, a lot of these reasons can be a bonus reason for choosing to rebuild the relationship, but they cannot be the primary reason for rebuilding the relationship, especially when I work with couples who say we need to stay together for the sake of the kids. Uh, yes, it's important to have an intact household, but this will only be healthy if the two of you are actually able to rebuild trust and meet each other's needs. Having an intact household when there is no trust and when there is consistent uh, fighting and struggles, that's not really healthy for the children. Uh, also, you know, sometimes people want to separate because they're worried about uh, what other people think. Uh, like I said, that cannot be a good reason for choosing the path to separate because people are going to move on with their life and you're going to be stuck dealing with the consequences of the choice that you have made. Uh, it is important when the two of you decide on creating an action plan of separation or rebuilding is to choose a start time for implementation. Uh, it is also important to develop short-term and long-term goals for each one of those action plans. So uh, the short-term and long-term goals for an action plan of separation should be related to how do we separate in an amicable way with minimum distraction and uh, challenges for people around us. Uh, a plan of action for rebuilding the relationship, the short-term goals are going to be focused on uh, rebuilding trust and uh, transparency and the long-term goals are going to be addressing all the different individual, relational, as well as environmental factors that have caused the affair. It is important that each one of these goals have concrete steps and measurable indicators. Uh, this is especially true when we consider the fact that when people choose a path, they are really anxious about uh, uh, the outcome of the choices that they have made and it's a lot easier for them to stay on this path and assess whether or not it's the right one for them if they have concrete steps and measurable indicators that would help them uh, either stay on this path or reconsider choosing a different one. The sixth milestone of the recovery process is the milestones of implementation and healing pains. The clinical objective is to implement the plan of recovery. At this point of time, we are talking about the couples who decided to pursue the path of rebuilding their relationship with one another. Uh, it is very important uh, for you and your partner to stick to the action plan that you have developed. Uh, it is also important uh, to make sure that the two of you showing your effort and showing your work on this action plan because this will help the two of you avoid uh, misperception or misinterpretation of efforts. As I have said before, this is a difficult choice to make uh, and it's important for both parties to know that uh, everybody's doing their best effort to achieve uh, full recovery and rebuilding trust. And also I would say a good plan, it's a plan that is uh, adaptable, uh, the best laid out action plan for treatment are going to be uh, needing some modification when people try to implement it. It is important for you and your partner to assess your progress, uh, reevaluate some of the short-term and long-term goals that you have, as well as the steps that were made to uh, achieve those desired outcomes and make an adjustment. But it's really important to treat this action plan as a live document, and this is something that your therapist should help you uh, create based on 
uh, the factors uh, that have led to the infidelity. It is also important to treat this action plan as the most important document in your guys' life because in order for you to rebuild trust, you have to see concrete changes in all these different factors that have led to the infidelity. But also important to see this plan as a life document, meaning you and your partner uh, need to uh, consistently evaluate it and make the necessary adjustment. But I cannot emphasize making those changes or adjustments should not happen in a unilateral fashion. If either of you feel that we need to add a different factor, remove a different factor, add a different goal, or add a different step, that's fine. The two of you need to do this uh, in unison. Uh, two of you need to sit together and figure out what is it that you're changing and why you're changing it? And what is the outcome you hope to achieve from making those changes? It's also important to remind each other to be patient with one another and uh, having some empathy. Uh, so being patient with your partner, and this is for the betrayed ears, it doesn't mean that you have to give the unfaithful multiple opportunities to continue to be unfaithful and dishonest before they get it. There has to be some red lines, and those red lines should include 100% uh, honesty, rain or shine. And honesty is not just simply telling the truth, but also uh, not omitting uh, important pieces of information. Uh, transparency, full transparency about interaction also should be expected and violation of giving access to that transparency should also be treated as a red line. Uh, what I'm talking about the areas of growth and being patient with your partner is the things that uh, lend itself to uh, uh, being a work in progress. For example, let's say uh, the infidelity was caused by a relationship factor related to poor communication or conflict resolution. So the action plan should have specific short-term and long-term goals as well as specific steps to help uh, both partners get better in communication and conflict resolution. So you and your partner are not going to be uh, a plus communicator overnight just because you're dealing with infidelity. That's a skill set that lend itself to work on progress, something that you uh, can make significant improvement on versus expecting it to be changed 100% right away. So that's what I mean about being patient and empathetic about the things that lend itself to work in progress versus the things that you're either gonna do it or, or not, which is the red lines. Uh, it's also important to uh, both for you and your partner to have clear understanding and being prepared for the healing pains. So infidelity is a traumatic event. And if we pull up the DSM-5 uh, and the clinical criteria for diagnosing somebody with PTSD, uh, you will notice that uh, a lot of times people who have been betrayed have uh, a lot of the symptoms that people who are dealing with PTSD struggle with because it is a traumatic event which means that there will be flashbacks, there will be triggers, and the unfaithful need to understand, both unfaithful and betrayed need to understand that this is part of the process. So just because you're dealing with triggers, it doesn't mean that uh, that you're not getting better or if you're having flashbacks. It's just this is the residual impact of the trauma. How people deal with the triggers and how they show up for their partner is going to determine the frequency and the intensity of these uh, PTSD symptoms down the road. And this is why the individual therapy is going to be helpful for both partners to navigate those issues. But one thing I emphasize for the unfaithful, um, you know, if the betrayed is having triggers, it's not, for, it's not fun for them to have triggers in the first place. So you need to show up for them uh, no matter when they're asking for you to show up because they don't have to include you in helping them process that trigger. They're reaching out to help give you an opportunity to clean up uh, this mess that was created by your actions, uh, which, which means that uh, we cannot just say, stop having those triggers. I don't have time for dealing with them because it's inconvenient for them to deal with triggers in the first place. And as I mentioned before, dealing with the trigger should not uh, entail revisiting the story and asking questions we already know the answers for. 
dealing with the triggers uh, should entail identifying what is needed uh, from the unfaithful at this time to help process those difficult emotions. And a lot of times it's just really uh, the betrayed needing reassurance, need an acknowledgement that what I did this was awful and here's all the work that I'm doing to make sure this won't happen again. But uh, sometimes the trade might not even know what they need from their partner during that trigger. So if you're that faithful, you can ask, you know, the, I, I'm not sure what you need from me at this point of time, or if I, what I'm doing is wrong, please let me know what else I can do in the moment to help, even if it's as simple as being there for you and we can figure this out together. So even if the betrayed doesn't know what they need, you can show up and say, okay, I'll help you try to figure that out. So the last milestone we're going to talk about is the seven milestone, which is uh, sustainability. And the clinical objective here is to uh, help you and your partner sustain the new healthy baseline of the relationship. So if you and your partner actually undergo this process and everybody does their part uh, and we get the story, we acknowledge the impact, and we come up with a game plan to address the factors that led to the infidelity, uh, you and your partner have the potential of having a healthier, better relationship than you ever had. And I know it's hard to imagine because how could infidelity lead to a positive thing? Uh, it's not that I'm saying that infidelity is the way to get a healthier, better relationship. I see it as that you know, rude wake up call that uh, have a potential for silver lining because uh, getting to this point means that you and your partner have got an opportunity to introspect and reflect on all the individual, relational, as well as environmental factors that needed to be looked at and changed prior to the infidelity taking place. Which means that when we have this new healthy baseline of the relationship, we need to protect it uh, as fiercely as we can. Uh, this is why it's important to help develop early warning signs. Uh, it's important also to engage in what I'd like to call a perpetual awareness of self and others. Uh, once people have infidelity in their life, they can no longer be on autopilot. Both you and your partner need to be always aware of your thoughts, your feelings, and to what extent those thoughts and feelings are impacting your behavior and interaction with your partner. Uh, it's important to adopt a forward-thinking attitude. Uh, what I mean by that is always being uh, aware of how you can uh, prepare for triggers and manage them in an effective way rather than just being surprised by them. Uh, it's also important for you and your partner to have regular check-ins. I call it the business meeting for the relationship. So this is not a replacement for your couples counseling. This is an opportunity for you and your partner to have a business meeting to reevaluate the action plan. Uh, a business meeting, I'd say, at a minimum once a week. Uh, you take the time for you and your partner with minimum distraction to go over the action plan, sharing what's working, what you like more of, what you appreciate, as well as uh, progress in all the uh, factors that were identified as relating to uh, the cause of the affair. Uh, and also, uh, this is the opportunity to kind of uh, not only acknowledge the effort, but also making the necessary changes to make sure the two of you take your relationship to the next level. Uh, in the future, once all the items on the action plan related to the infidelity were resolved, I recommend for people to continue to have business meeting for their relationship because it's just a good practice to have. It's an opportunity for you to get feedback and give feedback about your satisfaction in the relationship and uh, the fulfillment uh, of your needs and your partner's needs. Uh, it's also important to understand and plan for deviation for the new baseline. So even in the best circumstances where people are doing their best effort to work actively on this action plan, they might have an off day. Somebody might get sick. Somebody might uh, get overwhelmed with the stress or work. So deviation from this new healthy baseline by itself does not mean indication for relapse it just means something is going on that we need to address to figure out why are we uh, moving away from this new healthy baseline that we have established 
So when we see any deviation from this no healthy baseline, so we need to bring it up, we need to talk about it, why is this happening, identify the cause, and develop immediate and aggressive interventions so that this normal deviation doesn't turn into a full-on relapse. Now that we have gone over the clinical milestones of recovery that you and your partner need to undergo in order for the two of you to choose a path of recovery, let's spend some time talking about uh, how to go about finding the right therapist. So remember, as I mentioned earlier in the course, um, infidelity recovery is not something that people should do on their own. Uh, you need to hire not only a couples therapist to help the two of you make sense of the infidelity and how to choose a path, but also you need to consider individual counseling for both the betrayed and the unfaithful, uh, as well as the potential for considering family counseling if the two of you uh, somehow manage to expose your kids to the knowledge about the discovery of the affair. When it comes to couples counseling, uh, in a perfect world, you would find a couples counselor who is not only comfortable working with couples, but also somebody who is uh, comfortable in working with couples who are dealing with infidelity and have specialized training in infidelity recovery. This will be a challenge because the field of infidelity recovery is at its infancy. Uh, this is why I created Systematic Affair Recovery Therapy to train other therapists. So you're more than welcome to look at the Systematic Affair Recovery Therapy.com website and take a look at the directory of the therapists that I have trained in my model. Uh, but at a minimum, if you're not able to find somebody in your area who is uh, trained in Systematic Affair Recovery Therapy, you need to find somebody who have a lot of experience working with couples and somebody who have some clinical tools uh, that are uh, close to the process of the recovery that I have outlined. And also they're more than welcome. You can refer them to uh, reading my book, which is Infidelity, the best worst thing that could happen to your marriage. And it outlines the steps that I have uh, shared with you so far in this course. When it comes to the individual therapy uh, for the betrayed, it is really important for you to see somebody who is specialized in trauma recovery. And as I have mentioned before, uh, some of the treatment modalities that I recommend for the betrayed in individual counseling is something called brain spotting or EMDR. Uh, these happen to be the cutting edge treatment uh, for trauma. And you can uh, certainly get on Google and uh, Google therapists in your area and see if they have those specialties. Uh, for the unfaithful partner, uh, whatever individual therapist that they're going to see, uh, it needs to be someone who is specialized in the individual issue that the unfaithful have problem with. So if one of the individual factors, substance abuse and dependency, then uh, the unfaithful needs somebody who is specialized in that. If the uh, contributing factor was something related to sex addiction or pornography addiction, then the unfaithful need to see an individual therapist who specializes in that. And as I have mentioned before, uh, the individual therapist and the couples therapist should be having open lines of communication so that everybody working uh, toward the same goals. Uh, as far as what to expect from therapy and when to start therapy, so a lot of times you hear people say, don't do couples counseling, focus on individual counseling before you do couples counseling. Uh, I, I think it's really difficult for the unfaithful and the betrayed to figure out what they're going to do about their relationship if they're not involved in couples counseling. So I recommend for people to not uh, prioritize one over the other. Uh, even if you have to prioritize, I would encourage you to prioritize that couples counseling because that's the first thing you need to do is to figure out the what and the why uh, and which path do I need to choose to whether to rebuild uh, together or heal individually. Uh, but I really recommend for you to do them both at the same track, starting with the couples counseling and having the individual counseling be as adjunct services to provide support and address the individual issues that have led to the infidelity. Uh, as far as um, what to expect from the process, I really believe that therapy is, uh, is a process that should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
uh, therapy is not designed to be forever. You should not be engaged in therapy for years and years and years. Uh, the therapy process should be uh, clear. Your therapist's job is not just only to help you process your thoughts and feelings. Their job is also to help you achieve the clinical objectives of the milestones we went over. Uh, which mean which lead to the question of how do I know the therapy is working? Well, you know the therapy is working if uh, you and your partner are actually completing those milestones that we talked about. If you are able to get a clear narrative, if this narrative uh, help facilitate an opportunity to acknowledge the impact appropriately, and uh, if all of that lead to creating a concrete plan of action in which you and your partner will follow. More importantly, uh, therapy is as good as what you do with it. So uh, if you actually manage to find a therapist who help you navigate those milestones of recovery, uh, you and your partner's job is going to be to follow through with the action plans and the agreements uh, that were uh, made as a result of the counseling process. Also, one thing to expect is that uh, any counseling that's worth its salt, it's going to be something that's uh, difficult to endure. What I mean by that, counseling is supposed to help you and your clients uncover some unpleasant facts about yourself, about your partner, about the relationship. So it's not going to be easy. Uh, a lot of times I get clients who, uh, and usually it's that unfaithful who feels very uncomfortable with the failure recovery process and they feel like, you know, we're only talking about the negative. Well, I always give the example, if your car is broken and you're going to take it to a mechanic, they're going to they're gonna spend all this time talking about all the things that are working in your car. They're going to spend all this time talking about what's broken and what needs to happen to fix it. So uh, be prepared that infidelity recovery is not going to be uh, similar to the traditional kind of counseling where, you know, where it's just process oriented and how does that make you feel? Yes, there will be some process, but really it's more of a surgery versus an outpatient. Uh, so it will be difficult, it will be painful, but it's a necessary evil. There is no way around it other than through it. Uh, so. Hopefully that addresses the piece about how to go about finding the right therapist. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, for viewing this course. The last thing that I'm going to leave you with was some resources that can help you learn more about the infidelity recovery process and my work. And you're more than welcome to reach out to me directly through uh, my uh, main website. The first resource we're going to look at is my first book, Infidelity, The Best Worst Thing That Could Happen to Your Marriage. In this book, you will see uh, comprehensive and detailed discussions of the milestones of recovery that we went over in the course. I recommend uh, for both you and your partner to read this book to understand the process and what needs to happen to get to that point. And as I mentioned, you know, a self-help book by itself is not going to fix it. It's going to give you the blueprints of what you need to do, as well as a better understanding of what not to do to make sure that you uh, achieve the optimal outcome of recovery, regardless of which destination the two of you end up choosing. The second resource we're going to take a look at is my new book, Unfaithful and Unrepentant, Affairs Beyond the Hope of Repair. And uh, this book was designed uh, to illustrate the type of unfaithful partners that makes it really difficult for the betrayed to get what they need in order for them to rebuild trust or choose uh, healing the relationship as an option. Uh, this is not going to be applicable for every person who is uh, dealing with infidelity. This is applicable for the couples, uh, specifically the trade partners, who are questioning whether or not rebuilding is the right option for them because of their concern about how the unfaithful has been behaving since the discovery of the infidelity. So this book is going to show uh, the do's and don'ts that one would expect from the unfaithful partner, and that will help uh, uh, you and your partner uh, get a better understanding if uh, you're going to be dealing with uh, one of those complicated cases of infidelity in which the unfaithful 
is really not doing what needs to happen to achieve uh, repairing trust and healing the relationship. The last resource I'm going to share with you is my YouTube channel. And uh, in my YouTube channel, you will see two different kind of videos. You will see uh, Ask Dr. Talal videos, and you'll see me answer questions that other unfaithful and betrayed partners have reached out to me and me providing them an answer for their specific uh, uh, inquiries. You will also find uh, my docu-series, The Infidelity Chronicles. Uh, the docu-series was created to showcase the systematic affair recovery therapy model working with uh, extremely challenging cases of infidelity. Once again, thank you so much for taking the time to view the course. I hope the information you learned about today is going to be helpful in uh, putting you and your partner on the right path of recovery. Until then, be well, be safe, and embrace the possibility for a brighter future. Take care.